Hello, everybody. Welcome to another in our series of Half Earth Project Educator Ambassador video chats. And um, as most of you know, some of these chats feature authors. We're trying to sort of explore, I call it exploring biodiversity a chapter at a time. Um, and uh, I'm just so pleased to have uh, Denise Ray, uh, who's the author of Ecology of a Cracker Childhood. She's agreed to to be our, our uh, have a conversation this this morning. How are you doing, Denise? I'm good. Thank good. you so much for having me. Oh yeah, I, I'm I'm just so pleased that you could that, that you could find the time to do this. And it's exciting because Ecology of a Cracker Childhood has been reissued uh, in a twentieth. I had I just didn't realize the book was that old, uh, 20th anniversary edition. I think that that makes you that 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 qualifies as now a classic. So you have written a classic. The book is a bit of a memoir, and it it um, it, it talks a, a lot about your up. I mean, there's two really great themes about it. It's about your upbringing in a certain place and obviously your family and the other characters in your life, but it's also about the longleaf pine ecosystem. So between those two themes, um, I just really, really like the book. But um, so maybe we could start off with you just telling me a little bit about, you know, where you grew up and how you grew up. And do I have it right? Baxley, Georgia? You are perfect. I, and you see there US 1 North. Yeah. So I grew up about a mile north of Baxley on US 1 North. Okay. And, and the green corridor is the Altamaha River, which is a, a gorgeous, uh, it's the fourth largest river, that's right, flowing out of the Atlantic seaboard. Um, I, the, it, I'm, I'm so glad you figured out. So I was writing a, a natural history and a personal history um, two narratives paired together, kind of showing, trying to show that the trajectory of one is similar to the trajectory of the other. Um, I knew, I really, uh, Dennis, I, I have to tell you, I'm watching, I'm watching wood storks out the window, oh. circling <laughs> above the pasture. Well, you're know. okay. I've got red shoulders, red shouldered fledglings. Uh, red-shouldered hawks, and so I, uh, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do this every once in a while as well because I'll have a snake or something. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. So um, I'm sorry, but while so while you mention that, where are you now? You're, I know you've traveled around a bit, as 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 many of us do in this modern age. But you're and you're back in Georgia now. Where do you live now? Yes. So if you go north to Lyons and then turn toward, like heading toward Savannah. I live in a county just across the Altamaha River. Um, don't go that far, yeah. but I live, yeah. I live just across the Altamaha River in a county called Tattnall. And I, I, the reason I came back home, okay, so let me go back one minute and say this. Yeah. I wanted to write about this ecosystem. When I heard about it, it was already 99% gone. Reed Noss had been doing a survey for the National Biological Service, and he found that by 1993, that 99% of natural stands of old, grief, old growth longleaf had disappeared. So I, I just thought that nobody would read a book about a pine tree, and, and I used my childhood as a vehicle to tell what I consider is a much larger story you know, the interesting thing is that there were publishers who said, if you take out all of the natural history, we'll publish this. But it was, it's very important to me that, that we think about place and how, uh, how a culture and cultures and people spring from the places in which they find themselves. This was a, you know, not some small, rare, ecosystem in the southeast United States. Um, yeah. Yeah, 90, 93 million acres of the coastal plains from South Virginia to East Texas, um, down into Florida. And you can see in Georgia and Alabama, we have a kind of 
of longleaf called montane longleaf, which uh, grows through the Piedmont and up into the mountainous area. Yeah. That's right. Yep. I didn't actually know about it when I was writing the book. And, mm. and so if I, you know, if I ever got a chance to rewrite it, I would add a chapter about montane longleaf. I've toured it now and spent some time in it a number of times. Um, mm. But that's, that's a beautiful map. It's and 93 million acres and 99% of the natural stands gone, but an, ent an entirely hopeful ecosystem because um, it's so, it's, it's just so beloved by people. It's become iconic and lots and lots of people are engaged in the restoration of it. There's a nationwide initiative to restore it. Millions of acres are being replanted. So a lot of hope for this ecosystem. Wow. Yeah, I found this one a little. There's a, there's a bunch of interesting maps on the project. Some emphasize different things. Uh, but this one was interesting because it sort of like was prioritizing uh, different areas. And I also knew I could see that it definitely included your original county of origin. Um, but, and also, as you know, this is a, a, a certain, Mr. E.O. Wilson, Dr. E.O. Wilson, um, it is, this is a beloved uh, ecosystem for him. Well, this is a good time for me to say what a beloved person he is. I have loved his work since the very beginning. I especially, I especially love his work where he talks about himself as a, a boy growing up in yeah. Alabama and as a person, you know, and I, I love, I love the more popular um, scientific work that he does, like Biophilia was a oh, yep. really transformative book for me. My, my favorite met, book of Ed's is Naturalist, you know, which is really, that's really his, his memoir. Yep. I love that book. Just loved it. And I, I met him a couple of times. He, of course, he did so many, he's done so many lectures around the country and around the world. And I just happened, I luckily have been in his presence a few times and just really grateful for that there was just this kid who grew up loving snakes <laughs> and frogs and became this man who cares so deeply about what happens to the natural world. So my gratitude to Dr. Wilson and to you for the work that you do. Yeah, well, well, thanks. And what thrills me most about Longleaf Forest is how the pine trees sing. The horizontal limbs of flattened crowns hold the wind as if they're vessels, sinking bowls, and air stirs in them like a whistling kettle. I lie in thick grasses covered with sun and listen to the music made there. This music cannot be heard anywhere else on the earth. Rustle, whisper, whinny, aria, chorus, ballad, lullaby. In the choirs of the original groves, the music must have resounded for hundreds of miles in a single note of rise and fall, lift and wane, and stirred the red cockaded woodpeckers nesting in the hearts of these pines where I also nest. Now we strain to hear the music. Anachronous, it has an edge. It falters, a great tongue chopped in pieces something happens to you in an old growth forest. At first, you're curious to see the tremendous girth and height of the trees, and you sally forth eager. You start to saunter, then amble, slower and slower, first like a fox, and then an armadillo, and then a tortoise, until you're trudging at the pace of an earthworm, and then even slower, the pace of a sassafras leaf's turning. The blood begins to languish in your veins until you think it's turned to sap. You look up at leaves so high, their shapes are beyond focus into far branches with circumferences as thick as most trees. I'm skipping a little. Every limb of your body becomes weighted. There's this strange current of energy running skyward like a thousand tiny bells tied to your capillaries. If you stay in one place too long, you know you'll root. 
I drink old growth forests like water. This is the homeland that built us. Here I walk shoulder to shoulder with history, my history. I'm in the presence of something ancient and venerable. I can see my place as human in a natural order, more grand, whole, and functional than I've ever witnessed. And I'm humbled, not frightened by it, comforted. It's as if a round table springs up in the cathedral of pines and God graciously pulls out a chair for me and I no longer have to worry about what happens to souls. Thank you. You say you went off to college not knowing the name of a single, <laughs> of a single wild bird except maybe the crow, um, but you credit um, this teacher, I think it was an elementary school science teacher um, tell, me, tell us a little bit about uh, Lucia Godfrey. It, so Lucia Godfrey taught middle school, you know, what we yeah. called junior high. Middle then. school, okay, yep. And, um, one day I had tried to, excuse me, tried to play football with the boys in my class, but they didn't want this girl wearing a dress to play football. So I went and joined Ms. Godfrey where she was standing looking off at a pine tree blooming. And so she began to tell me about um, pine trees, the natural history of pine trees, that there are male pine trees and there are female pine trees and how you would tell the two apart and what a cone means. And I found that fascinating. Her class was always like that. You know, it was a class um, that, it was a class that touched something inside me. So down, way down in the junkyard was a clump of pitcher plants, this carnivorous plant, Saracenia flava. This one was, I think, mm. flava. And I remember bringing one to school to her. You know, she was the kind of teacher who had microscopes set up and we could look at ditch water and study rocks and learn the names of things. So you're right, I do say I left home not you know, completely ignorant, never <laughs> having known a naturalist, but, but I would say this science teacher came pretty close to lighting a fire inside me. Yeah. And that's what all teachers can do. Mm -hmm. You know, with the home life that I had, I had extremely loving parents. You know, I had really, I had enough to eat. I, ha I always had clothing and shoes. And I had books, but where would I be without these teachers who, who told me things that nobody else in my life was telling me? Yeah. I mean, so many of us are so indebted to, to all of our teachers, you know, past, present, and future, really. Yeah. And so then this is a great time to say thanks for the teachers who devote their entire lives to bringing light to children, to adults, you know, enlightenment. They're just shining these lights that sometimes don't get shown otherwise. And bless them. Yeah, thank you so much. I feel, you know, I feel like I, when I think back, I, I wish I had said a little more appreciative things of some of my teachers <laughs> over the years. We, <laughs> You know, they don't realize, some of them don't realize the impact they have and how appreciated they are. So I hope, I hope Ms. Godfrey got to, to, to read that chapter, but. Um, she did. Yeah. She did. Excellent. Yep. So good. And in fact, you know, a lot of my teachers, since I moved back to the same area, I still see a lot of the teachers I had. So I've been able to express gratitude a lot to the people who, lifted me out of a of a childhood that was often inexplicable and yeah yeah and so to teachers who are listening then you know i think i think teachers know better than the rest of us the, the power that they have to to transform a life to bring a story alive even a story for a child who's mute and whose story hasn't been told. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazing gift that they've been given 
to shepherd children and to enlightenment. I was visiting a school in Thomasville, Georgia, and one of the students, I hung it up on the shoji screen for this. One of the students had painted this for me, and I brought another one. I didn't, I didn't have time to hang them both up, but oh. this is crayon, you know, it's wax, and another student did that. It's just amazing. I get to go, you know, it's what a lovely life. You get yeah. to go talk to kids and they get to give you presents like that painting. <laughs>